Please give it up for Miss Arthur Kapoor. So what's a typical day in Manhattan? This past Monday is probably a good example. Alarm rings. Wake up. Slip on my designer Mishy activewear. Go for a $34 spin class at SoulCycle. Get ready. Grab a $6 green tea matcha latte from Vika Espresso Bar. Almond, not dairy milk, and egg whites on the side. Work until I, dry, I get a kale salad and a green juice from Juice Press. In between, lots of meetings and calls. Lots of meetings and calls. Usually something fun in the evening. Sleep, repeat. Now, if we were to flashback several years ago, my designer yoga pants would have been my old workout shorts. Soul Cycle would have been a run on the treadmill in the basement gym if I even worked out at all that day. The green tea matcha latte would have been a copy from pretty much anywhere that was convenient on the way to work. Salad would have been a big fat sandwich with a Diet Coke on the side from wherever my colleagues really wanted to go for lunch. None of the brands would have quite mattered to me. And, you know, even though I may have been 10 pounds heavier, my bank account certainly looked better. So what's changed? More than a few things have changed. The products and experiences that I choose today are best in class in their respective categories. They're highly branded and come with aspirational lifestyles that I want to be associated with, a lifestyle of wellness in particular. These brands are high touch. They're focused on me as a consumer. They remember my preferences, the way that I behave, my purchasing patterns. They even remember my favorite green juice and when I took class last. I can reach them anytime I want. 24 7 365 on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and even through the brand community that I know I'm an important part of. They're brands I can't wait to post about and share with my friends. So many things have changed. The last five to seven years have been among the most transformational for the high value consumer. A couple years ago, I stumbled upon my rapidly changing bank account, which was drained by fitness classes and green juices, and realized I was a great case study of how the consumer was changing. I lived on 21st Street in Manhattan. Flywheel Sports, a high-end cycling studio, had just opened. I walked by. $34 for a 45-minute class? Who would ever pay that much? Pfft. That was soon to be me. I tried out one class. This is what people pay for. It's a brand. It's a community. It's an experience. OK, I'll just buy a five-pack. That'll be my splurge. All right, just a 10-pack, one more splurge. OK, fine, just the unlimited membership that I have to paint an arm and a leg for. I'm sure it's going to be worth it. I got that unlimited membership, and it was absolutely worth it. In recent years, consumers have shifted away from big box, generic concepts, where brand didn't really matter, to premium boutique concepts, where brand and experience are just about everything. That latter category arguably didn't really exist before. So my question for today, what do we want? As consumers, that is. I'd like to discuss the recent evolution in consumer purchasing habits and what it means for upcoming trends across the broader consumer and retail marketplace. Given the shift in our collective preferences, how we spend our time and how we spend our money, pockets of growth have never looked more different than they did historically. There's an emerging opportunity for high-end specialty brands across the landscape. Food, beverage, apparel, beauty, fitness, and so much more. All of them, or many of them, have a trend that you'll see called the better for you trend, the push towards wellness, catering to today's health focus, wellness impassioned consumer. So who is the new age consumer anyway? I like to call it the conscious consumer. In today's age of information, or the digital age, we have access to more information than ever before, with the internet and smartphones and the rise of bloggers and vloggers and brand influencers and the way that people share information we can figure out just about anything about the products and services that we seek. Which brands are the best? Within those, which product lines are the best? Within those, which SKUs are the best? What flavor am I going to like the most? How do I get the best deal? We are very sophisticated, savvy consumers. And as a result, we expect more from what we spend on. In addition to being savvy shoppers, we're also more educated consumers. And a big area of education has been around what's good for us. What, what really contributes to our personal well-being, which many would argue is the ultimate goal. Fitness, healthy consumption, mental wellness. 
an understanding of the mind-body connection, the importance of preventative health, the list goes on. The confluence of this consumer sophistication and savviness and consumer education has given rise to a meaningful uptake in the health and wellness category and many of the better for you trends that I mentioned earlier. Well, many of the behaviors that I will speak about today first got activated in urban hubs that are trend setting like New York and LA. What we're seeing is that a lot of the same behaviors are emerging in tier two, in tier three cities, in suburbs, not just in urban cities, domestically and abroad. Let's look at a couple illustrative behaviors. Instead of hitting the big box gym, as I alluded to earlier, consumers are attending high-end group fitness classes, best-in-class cycling spots, best-in-class boot camp spots. These places offer a better experience, a community, and frankly, more accountability in your workout. We may also reach for, instead of Tropicana juice with 35 grams of sugar, we might reach for juice press, a green smoothie with a fraction of the sugar and more than our required daily dose of greens. And suppose you're watching the game. Well, we might actually reach for Brad's kale chips ranch flavored instead of Doritos ranch flavored. We might even have a relaxation app on our iPhone so that we make use of the time commuting to and from work every day. The aspiration for wellness is on a rapid surge. Did you know that 20 years ago, consumers surveyed, 10% of them knew about the term wellness. They said, you know, wellness is only on my radar this much. Today, that number is 90%. And of the 90%, 80% said they actually want to improve their personal wellness levels. It may all cost a pretty penny, but the consumer has shown price inelasticity on this front. The consumer, in fact, has reshuffled discretionary spending in favor of wellness. Think more protein shakes and fewer cocktails. 85% of consumers say that they're willing to pay more than the standard price for a product or service if a good experience comes with it. So there we are, the conscious, educated, brand-focused, wellness-focused consumer. So how do these preferences translate into what the consumer wants? With a meaningful contingent of price-insensitive consumers who are willing to pay up for a premium brand or product or service, a new segment or a new trend has really emerged across consumer retail, what I call the boutiquing effect, where small specialty premium offerings that are best in class in a niche category are collectively taking share from larger big box generic offerings that once employed a one size fits all approach and tried to be everything to everyone. Consumers today are seeking brands offering quality, specialization, customization, and personalization and a real brand experience. We talked about the fitness shift, showing evolution on the services side. The neighborhood gym offers an array of machines and classes, but it's now losing share to concepts like SoulCycle and Barry's Bootcamp, even if they only focus on one thing and cost a heck of a lot more. They offer community, identity, accountability, and much more. But in addition to the services space, we're seeing this trend in products too. Let's say I want a new pair of running shoes. Could go to Sports Authority, navigate lanes and lanes of shoe offerings blindly, not knowing exactly what's good for me. Or I could choose a specialty option, New York Running Company, where an educated salesperson is gonna tell me exactly what my gait and my run looks like when I'm on the treadmill and what shoe is good for my specific needs. Similarly, we've seen a boutiquing of high-end activewear. The Yoga Smogas, the Beyond Yogas, the Mishis, the Sweaty Bettys, they're all collectively giving a challenge and presenting a challenge to Nikes and Reeboks of the world. The move towards specialization Interestingly enough, spans formats, i.e. products and services, as well as categories, food, beverage, fitness, beauty, and so many other categories. Today's consumer would rather engage with several specialty brands to fit all of his or her different needs, rather than having one mid-tier brand that tries to be a jack of all trades but a master of none. While today I'm mostly, mostly focusing on the high end of specialization, I know that specialization has also begun to exist on the budget concept. In the bifurcated fitness world, for example, we can look at Planet Fitness. $9.99 a month instead of hundreds a month. Very low touch, do whatever you want, versus high touch, curated experience. A gym for people who don't really like gyms versus a gym for the fitness fanatics of the world. Yet, still highly branded, highly distinctive, and highly successful. Now let's cut the market a different way. Instead of looking at what's growing, let's look at who's buying. These are ultimately the consumers that businesses really need to think about catering to as they think about their strategy for growth. 
While there are several driving forces in today's market, I'll speak about two in particular, women and millennials. Women, I'm happy to say, control 85% of household spending decisions and influence even more when it comes to healthy consumables, beauty, fitness, and anti-aging. These very same women are earning more now than ever before, and their income and purchasing power is increasing at a rate that outpaces that of their male counterparts. So not only are they high-value consumers in the segments we've discussed today, but they're increasingly high-value, powerful consumers. They're a driving force in consumer lifestyle brands. Then we have millennials. Millennial shoppers are in some ways even more fascinating. With the greatest level of savviness and sophistication in their shopping and a very distinct set of preferences and purchasing habits. We discuss their access to information through smartphones, social media, references, their friends, brand influencers. 80% say that they look at a product or a service online before they actually make the purchase. They also value authenticity and quality of brands and they want to connect with these brands. It's a brand engagement that keeps them coming back. Millennials, 80 million of us, we're currently the largest generation today, even surpassing baby boomers. So millennial spending really matters. So what does all this mean for the consumer retail marketplace? We discussed the shift in consumer preferences and demographic segments most powerfully driving this, this spending. But what does this mean for who's growing and who isn't? How do we predict the winners and losers in the marketplace? Let's look at some success factors. One, the better for you movement. First and foremost, health and wellness is on the rise and all consumer retail categories are moving that direction. It's what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, the spray you use to clean off your counters, and the cleanser you use to wash your face. There's been a big push from Coca-Cola to Clorox towards better for you simplistic offerings with a big move back to the basics. Natural, organic, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, nut-free, fresh, plant-based, non-GMO, you have heard it all. Wellness is an engine of growth for many companies that once made their money off of not-so-wellness promoting products. Many large CPG companies will seek to acquire smaller high-growth companies in order to buy versus build that growth. Two, the move towards specialization. We discussed how spending has shifted away from these large conglomerates with a one-size-fits-all approach to premium boutique offerings with best-in-class expertise. Attempting to be a brand that's everything to everyone is no longer the key to success. Three, highly branded experiences and consumer engagement. Successful businesses have cultivated a well-defined brand ethos that becomes part of the consumer's broader identity. Such businesses are highly connected to the consumer with multiple forms of continuous engagement, from in-store experiences to email marketing campaigns to an active social media presence to brand ambassadors and influencers in community events and more. Brands are just as much about the experience that comes with them, with the, the key offering, as the key offering itself. Distinction in a crowded marketplace, four. While many of these smaller emerging brands have collectively as a whole been chipping away at the larger brands that once dominated the marketplace, these segments we discussed are still highly fragmented. It will be important for a long-term successful business for a business to have an angle, an edge, a unique positioning versus competitors. There are countless brands that have micro communities that got them started, but can all of them become billion dollar companies? There's not room for everyone to go big. Ultimately, in the long run, a lot of brands will get consolidated if they're similar. The goal is to be the brand name that persists. Five, speaking of which, scalability. Many concepts can survive in urban hubs such as Manhattan, as we mentioned, due to the perfect trifecta of population density, purchasing power, and a cultural-minded openness to try really anything. But the real test is for brands if they can survive out, outside of New York and LA, in tier two, in tier three cities, or in suburbs versus urban hubs. It's a question of defining the total addressable market. It can't be everything to everyone, but you can't be so niche that you're not expandable. So what now, you might wonder, what does all this mean to you? Understanding the new age consumer psyche, both in preferences and what it means for ensuing behaviors, is an invaluable learning. While you've likely thought about yourself as a consumer, most people haven't considered the impact of the collective consumer. That is, what all the people in this room, or in this town, or in this country might add up to in impacting the broader landscape. When consumer preferences shift, companies shift, and economic flows shift, the whole market shifts accordingly. 
Knowing the consumer is relevant across various settings. For the future marketer in you, future investor in you, future entrepreneur in you, and of course the future spender in you. We're all participants in the broader consumer retail ecosystem every day of our lives. Every day we interact with so many brands, either through our purchases or being bombarded by thousands of advertisements in every store and every website we visit. Understanding yourself as a consumer and the many businesses marketing to you is just another element of elevating your status as a savvy, conscious, new age consumer. You're a VIP now. Welcome to the club. Wishing you wellness. Thank you.